Well, uh, in case you have your uh, Sunday School Quarterly before you, uh, this is the midweek lesson for August the 12th. Uh, actually, it's for uh, last Sunday's lesson, which would be August 12th lesson. So just follow along. I encourage you, if you are uh, doing these lessons with us uh, on YouTube or wherever, that you uh, always get your quarterly out and follow along. It's just simply a Sunday School lesson. But today we'll be talking about discipline, uh, how God disciplines his people uh, to keep us in shape to follow him and be all that we can be for him. The title of the lesson this week is Accepting Discipline. Now there's three types of discipline. There's preventative discipline, there's supportive discipline, and there's corrective discipline. Uh, you can't see my notes, but I have a line drawn through corrective discipline. And we'll see why in just a little later in the lesson. But God uses discipline from society and from our families and from other sources to shape his people into being all that we need to be as followers of Christ. Proverbs 29 1 through 3 and 12 through 20 is our actual passage focus for this week. Now, this whole area, this whole section of, of the Proverbs that we're looking at now uh, has two appeals. One is to trust God into everything that we do. Trust God in everything in life. That's one appeal. The other appeal is involves choosing the path of righteousness uh, or living a life of uprightness and avoiding the paths of evil. Those are the two appeals for this entire section of Scripture. And in the midst of that, we should, uh, as God's people, we should have a goal uh, to follow. And the lesson starts out in the first section, the title, The Goal, Proverbs 29. Verses 1, 2, and 3. Let me read them to you. Proverbs 29, 1 says, One who becomes stiff-necked after many reprimands will be shattered instantly beyond recovery. Verse 2. When the righteous, that is, or the upright, or people who are right in a moral way, when the righteous flourish, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, people groan. Verse 3. A man who loves wisdom brings joy to his father. But one who consorts, or that is, spends a lot of time with prostitutes, destroys his wealth. So, being disciplined doesn't always imply punishment, at least in biblical terms, where God is working with his people. Now, that's why I drew a line through um, corrective discipline. God isn't always, he, he's not always punishing us for what we, uh, when he tries to give us discipline. What he wants us to do, he wants to render within us a humble willingness to submit ourselves to him. Now, throughout Scripture and studying the life and times of Christianity, uh, being humble is one of the things that stands out with God. He wants his people to be humble. In fact, Scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians 7, 14, a very familiar Scripture, if uh, I may say, uh, if people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive them their sin and I will heal their land. If people who are called by my name, what does it mean? In your words, what does it mean to be called by 
my name. Well, that means that we are his elect. We are special. We are chosen. God simply wants us to be humble, and he wants to refine us daily with discipline from those around us and not be offended or stiff-necked by that discipline. So being disciplined doesn't always imply punishment, at least in biblical terms, where God is working with his people. He wants to render within us a humble willingness to submit ourselves to him. In fact, scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians, which is a very familiar passage, 2 Corinthians 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive them their sin and I will heal their land. Isn't that a wonderful passage? Well, what does it mean to be called by my name? What do you think God meant by that? Well, it means that uh, we're his chosen, we're his elect, and we're special people to God. God simply wants us to be humble. He wants us to re- He wants to refine us daily with discipline from those around us and not be offended or stiff-necked by it. You see, Solomon said the big issue with discipline is becoming stiff-necked. You ever become stiff-necked? You know anyone that ever becomes stiff-necked from discipline? Well, I certainly have. Just like a stubborn mule becomes stiff-necked and resists a bridle, we can be stubborn and resist God's reprimands as opportunities to become humble and submissive to him. The future of stiff-necked individuals promises to be devastating. If we as God's people continue this kind of stubbornness, we become beyond recovery. You see, if we continue our stubbornness and stiff-neckedness, He allows us to face the shattering consequences. If I could stop right there for just a moment, I'd like to share a a deal with you, a story with you about when I was working at FedEx, uh, we decided we'd buy a company out of California called the Flying Tigers. Uh, The Flying Tigers was a big uh, aviation outfit. They had a lot of routes in Southeast Asia that we did not have. They had very uh, crippled equipment that needed a lot of maintenance, and their company was uh, deteriorating fast. And so FedEx acquired this company, and we took on a few of their uh, uh, employees and a few of their pilots. Uh, The department that I actually worked in, we took five of those men, and then the pilots took on a number of their pilots. And we finally sold and dissolved their equipment, and we took their routes. And that's why we go into the, some of the parts of uh, Asia that we go in today because flying tigers. But one of the people that we acquired from them was a pilot, and he didn't want to comply to Federal Express's rules in aviation. And every time they would reprimand him, he would become more stiff-necked and more stiff-necked. And he, as you probably read in the paper or saw in the national news, that one that caught a jump seat flight out of Memphis on one of our wide body jets. And when he got it in the air, he assaulted the pilots in the cockpit. Two of our pilots, the, our, the co-pilot and the, uh, the navigator, was able to take him to the floor after he had done, done pretty good bit of damage to them with what he carried on board. And I won't go into that. But the other pilot managed to get the aircraft back to Memphis and get it on the ground. Now, this pilot will never see the free world again. He is uh, he's in prison now for the rest of his natural life. Simply because of his stiff-deckness. He, he, he would reprimand it, but he wouldn't comply. 
over and over and over again. He was reprimanded. And that's kind of the way it is with us. But we're handpicked to glorify God, and he wants his representatives to be at the top of their game. And so we get reprimands from our family and friends and those around us to help us see our frailties and our weaknesses and to be uh, better, better soldiers for Christ. And with that, the lesson says that we have the availability to do that. Proverbs 29, 12 through 14 says these words. If a ruler listens, all his officials will be wicked. The poor and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives light to both. A king who judges the poor with fairness, his throne will be established forever. Now in Solomon's day, the people had no voice in the government whatsoever. And whatever the king said was the final word. Therefore, therefore, if the king took advice from lying, cheating individuals or advisors, then his rulership would become corrupt. The king's level of integrity would be influenced by the advice he receives, received. Now, if I could stop there again for just a moment, I realize that um, in my lifetime, uh, there's been lots of godly men and women put in my pathway for advice, for just helping me uh, in my career and where all I've been since I've become an adult. But I credit myself for accepting that advice and letting it help me build my character and build who I am as a Christian. Likewise, though, we as God's people should listen to wise and godly counsel. Oh, at the wise and godly counsel that I have been given. And not be stiff-necked. As one would say, don't bow up, but accept that advice and let it build your character. And God will open your eyes. He'll open our eyes and allow us to see the direction that he desires for us to follow. Take the advice and use it. Verse 13, though, alludes to the fact that poor people had no power and neither did the oppressor. Neither did the oppressor. And the oppressor was, was a ruler without any integrity. But they have in common, what they had in common is that the Lord sheds or gives light to, the, to both the oppressor and the poor. Verse 14 then, on the other hand, says, a king who judges the poor with fairness, his throne will be established forever. I like that. I don't know about you, but I like that. Uh, if he is a fair king, his throne would be established forever. He had nothing to worry about. I know some of what it's like to be looked down upon because of being poor. Uh, not nearly like my parents and my siblings because I'm the youngest of 10 kids. My older siblings and mom and daddy had it very, 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 very rough. But I know some of what this, uh, th this proverb is teaching. In Matthew's gospel, though, Chapter 14, Jesus reminded his disciples that the poor will always be with you. There's always going to be poor people in our society. And those are the people that we do not need to mistreat or, or oppress. You see, the writer of our lesson said that a king who never differentiates the wealthy from the poor and oppressed will have a throne that will last forever. When leaders give themselves to the Lord, they can count on him to make them wise, to lead with integrity. They can count on that. 
I recently saw Dr. Robert Jeffress, and you may not know who he is. If not, I ask that you Google him and read about him. Dr. Jeffress is the pastor of First Baptist Dallas. And he was recently in the White House with President Trump and his cabinet members. They were all standing behind the president, and the president was sitting at the table. And he turned to Dr. Jeffries and said, would you pray? And they laid hands on the, on the president and prayed with him. Dr. Jeffries prayed out loud. Now, to me, that's seeking wise counsel at its best with a leader. Because he recognizes the power of prayer and asks the man to pray. But then we have a responsibility, the lesson teaches us. Excuse me, in Proverbs 28, 15, 16, and 17, says these words. A rod of correction imparts wisdom. A rod of correction imparts wisdom. I've shared with you on occasion that my daddy could take a cotton stalk or whatever he could get his hands on, and he could share with me more wisdom than you could just imagine. Work for me. But a youth left to himself is a disgrace to his mother. Let me read that again. A rod of correction imparts wisdom, but a youth left to himself is a disgrace to his mother. Verse 16 says, when the wicked increases, rebellion increases but the righteous will see their downfall. What it's saying is, if we take wise counsel from God's uh, discipline to our friends and family, uh, we, will see, we will have righteousness that will see their, our downfall. Discipline, verse 17 says, discipline your child, and it will bring you peace of mind and give you delight. Verse 15 speaks of discipline in our children and parents have different ideas about discipline in, in a multitude of different ways. You see, time out with my daddy and time out with kids today were very different, may I say. I won't go into any detail, any more detail, because I can assure you it wouldn't fit with this lesson. But the fact of the matter is this. If we do not discipline our children, we are asking for problems down the road. And besides that, I think I turned out pretty good with daddy's discipline. So we need to discipline our children. As I look back on my life, especially, I can see God's discipline on every corner. Now you can see, you can see better through the eyes of a 70-year-old, and you can the eyes of a 15-year-old. You just can see better. They say with age that you your eyes begin to deteriorate, but when it comes to what we're talking about in this lesson, your eyesight gets better. And as I look back, I can see God's discipline just everywhere, how he tried to show me with the people he put in my pathway. People that God put in my pathway to encourage me, to discipline me, and to teach me the ways of righteousness. Oh, it's the people. But Solomon, King Solomon made it clear that if we do not discipline our children, they grow up to be a disgrace to the parents. How many times have we seen that? How many times? Then Solomon in verse 16 moved on to how the child grows up and lives in the community. You see, Solomon, in his infinite wisdom, made it clear, made it very clear that when discipline is withheld from a child, that child grows up and moves on out into society and in rebellion and wickedness begins to increase. Society, the community, begins to see people like that. Why is that so hard for today's adults to understand? Well, when you get an answer for that question, 
you share it with me. Look at verse 18. Without revelation, people run wild. But one who follows divine instruction will be happy. Without discipline, people do run wild. By the same token, listening to God and uh, focuses our thoughts on him, and it helps us to direct our energy according to his purpose and according to what he has for us in his kingdom. Solomon said in verse uh, 19, a servant cannot be disciplined by words. Though he understands, he doesn't respond. A servant cannot be disciplined by words, though he understands, but he does not respond. In Solomon's day, a servant may or may not hear his master's words of correction but and not respond positively. But we, Bartlett Hills, we as followers of Christ may hear what, what he's saying to us. We may hear every sound he says to us, but we may not be willing to conform our lives with keeping it. And we, we as Christians need to work on that. My, myself, what is required of a servant was a changed heart. When our heart changes, everything changes. And we as Christians are disciplined to take God's direction seriously. Being disciplined requires nurturing and humbleness and a willing heart. Such a change of heart enables one to listen to him carefully and obey him consistently. Listen carefully and obey consistently. Then our lesson concludes today with verse 20. Do you see someone who speaks too soon? There is more hope for a fool than for him. There's more hope for a fool than for one who speaks too soon. That's not Robbie, that's proverb. That's out of the Bible. We cannot listen to God when we cannot be quiet. The proverb in this verse, though, points you and I to the obstacles that prevent us from receiving God's word. Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. You see, hope is squandered by an unwillingness to be quiet long enough to listen to God. Well, the Proverbs and God's Word and our lesson today is concluded. But I trust that you'll go back, take your quarterly, read it, and try to process in your own mind what each of these Proverbs means to you. Ask yourself these questions. Am I stiff-necked when I hear my discipline? Number two. Am I hearing God's discipline in a positive way? Number three, do not do I have a place to be still and listen to God? Could be a devotion time of a morning. It could be at midnight. It could be on the lake. It could be anywhere. It could be on the golf course. Is there a place where I be still and listen to God? Number four, am I the servant? that God expects me to be? Am I the servant that God expects me to be? Do I have a humble and understanding heart? A humble and understanding heart. I hope that we all do. I hope that we all do. But in closing today, I echo the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. I know the Proverbs get tough sometimes. They kind of jump around and they jump across and they're kind of hard to understand. And so I trust that you'll go back and uh, look at them and, uh, and uh, search each one of them for your, for your own self. But in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, I leave you with this thought. I wish you this week, I wish each of you, Barnett Hills, this week, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Watch out for and accept and use God's discipline and may it humble you 
to be more like what he has called you to be. See you soon.